Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is John Bartow. I'm the Executive Director of the Empire State Forest Products Association, and welcome to the Adirondack Research Consortium's October webinar series. This is the fourth of five uh, webinars that have been happening on Friday, the month of October. Three, three of them are already recorded, and you can find them on the Adirondack Research Consortium YouTube channel on their website. This session, along with the final session next week, will also be recorded. Uh, so if you know of folks that are interested in the topic and would like to see them after they're done, uh, they can go back and do that. Today's uh, webinar is uh, focused on meeting the demands of climate change or of a changing climate with a focus on forests and wood products as a natural solution to climate change. This morning, we have three speakers. Uh, Jared Snyder is the Deputy Commissioner of Climate, Air and Energy at the New York State Department of Environmental Com Conservation. In that capacity, he oversees the development and implementation of clean air programs and climate change strategies, including programs to build resilience to climate change and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and implementation of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Also with us is Rob Davies, who serves as the director of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Division of Lands and Forests, which is responsible for the management of approximately 5 million acres of public forest land, including about 900,000 acres of conservation easements. Mr. Davies is also serves as the state forester and re is responsible for administration of forestry programs in partnership with the US Forest Service. Carl Moss is director of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority's Energy and Environmental Analysis Department and has responsibility for analysis and support of policy and program planning, as well as oversight of NYSERDA's environmental research portfolio. The ener energy planning support includes the authority's efforts with respect to regional greenhouse gas initiative, the New York State Energy Plan, and the Climate Action Council scoping plan, which is the focus of much of our conversation today. Um, we're going to allow the three speakers to do their presentations all within the first hour, and then we'll turn to questions and answers. If you have questions, you can post them at any time in the question and answer period or comment box that's on the bottom of your screen. We'll accept those questions there. Uh, the chat function, we won't, don't want you to use for questions, but if you want to chat with somebody else on the call, feel free to do that. But please, all your questions, direct them to the Q&A. And I, as well as uh, Melanie Johnson with the Adirondack Research Consortium, will sort through those questions and bring them to the panelists at the end. Um, so with that, I'd like to first thank uh, Melanie Johnson and uh, Dan Fitz for their coordination of this webinar series and the Adirondack Research Consortium and Paul Smith College for hosting it and pulling it together. Uh, we'll turn now to uh, Jared Snyder for our first presentation on the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Jared? Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, John. And uh, let me pull up my, my screen to share. Um, Does everybody see that? Yes, but if you click on the full view, it'll be larger for them. All right, and, and uh, let's... Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, walk through, you know, pretty briefly the the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which is the the groundbreaking legislation um, enacted in 2019 that that basically establishes the framework for the state to meet very ambitious um, emission reduction goals to combat the the climate crisis. And um, and then after my presentation, um, uh, Rob and Carl will address certain parts of it in 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 more detail. So the the legislation establishes very aggressive emission reduction goals. Um, uh, these are from 1990 levels: 40 percent emission reduction by 2030, 85 percent by 2050. Those are emission reductions, but it also establishes a goal of carbon neutrality in um, 2050, and that's really where you know sort of the the forest um, sector comes into play because of the ability of forests 
to sequester carbon and get us from that 85% reduction to carbon neutrality. Uh, the legislation also establishes very aggressive goals for um, renewable energy, 70% um, renewable energy by 2030, 100% zero carbon electricity by 2040, and there's a number of, of clean energy targets underneath that, like offshore wind, energy storage, uh, things like that. Um, it, the, the law has uh, establishes you know, a high priority on achieving environmental justice and just transition um, as, as we are achieving these goals. And it establishes a Climate Action Council that is to develop a scoping plan to meet those goals. And um, so the, the, the council has been, been hard at work over the last, you know, um, really year and a half to to develop that scoping plan. Um, in addition to recommendations to achieve those emission reduction targets and achieving that carbon neutral economy by, by 2050, the scoping plan should also include measures to aid in just transition, measures to reduce emissions in disadvantaged communities, that's, that's achieving environmental justice, a limit emission leakage. That means, you know, don't do things in New York State that just cause emissions to pop up elsewhere. And importantly, uh, the law requires a scoping plan to include measures to achieve healthy forests. Um, the, the, the process for developing the scoping plan involved a number of advisory panels that develop recommendations. And, I, and Rob will go into more detail on the, the recommendations of the um, the, the Forestry and Agriculture Advisory Panel. There's also a Climate Justice Working Group um, that provides its own input. And um, let me just go to the next slide. This gives you sort of the schedule for developing the plan. Um, that 2021 is has been focused on developing sort of the inputs to the plan. Um, a lot of work in the first part of the year um, by the advisory panels developing their recommendations and getting input from the, the Climate Justice Working Group. Now the council is considering all that information um, as well as an integration analysis that Carl will be touching on to develop the draft scoping plan, which is due in approximately two months. Then next year will involve getting public comment on that draft plan um, with a goal of or a requirement to deliver a final plan by the end of 2023. And then following that, DEC is required to um, develop regulations, implement regulations that achieve um, the goals of the act and implement the, the scoping plan. So um, Carl's going to be touching on the integration analysis. This just shows a little bit, you know, drills down a little bit in 2021 to show how the integration analysis fits into um, development of the scoping plan. The integration analysis is the process of taking all of those recommendations that were produced by the, the seven advisory panels and um, and, and additional input from the Climate Justice Working Group, for example, and, and figure out, does, do those recommendations achieve the emission reductions were required? And I, I'm not gonna say any more about that because Carl's gonna go into it in some more detail. And uh, so what, as I said, once the scoping plan is done, um, at the end of 2023, DEC is required to promulgate regulations um, in 2023 that ensure compliance with the reduction targets, um, reflect the findings of the scoping plan, maximize net benefits, reduce leakage, benefit disadvantaged communities. And, um, and the law also require, or allows DEC to adopt what's called an alternative compliance mechanism, which essentially offset mechanisms to achieve the additional reductions needed for carbon neutrality. So DEC is required to establish those regulations. The law also allows other agencies to pro promulgate regulations that contribute to meeting the emission limits. And as you'll see from 
um, Carl's discussion of the integration analysis, there's a lot of work for a lot of different agencies to to achieve these emission reduction goals. It's really, you know, an all hands on deck approach. So next slide. Um, and I guess I don't need to say next slide because I'm doing the slides. Um, the I just wanted to drill down a little bit into a um, a report that DEC is required to produce by the end of um, this year, and that's an emissions report. Basically, um, the process of using the accounting methodology, which is a pretty unique accounting methodology required by um, the legislation, to develop um, to, to to develop sort of the the what the emissions are in New York State, what they've been over the period from 1990 to 2019, and then that that you know sh sort of shows us what progress we're we're making on achieving the emission reduction goals. And periodically, we will be producing additional you know emission reports following the same methodology to track progress in implementing the scoping plan, progress towards achieving those emission reduction goals. This emissions report will include a, a special report on agriculture, forestry, and other land use. And um, this slide just describes that in a little bit of detail. Um, that that is, as far as the forestry um, forestry is concerned, there's, it's, it's looking at the, the removals that are taking place now. So, um, you know, with the other sectors, we're more focused on what their emissions are in the forestry sector. What remo what carbon removals are are being accomplished, achieved right now by the forestry sector to really provide a basis for for understanding where we need to go from there. And so it looks at. Um, Two categories of removals, harvested wood products where, you know, the wood is then sequestered um, in wood products, wood buildings, things like that. Um, and also land use. Uh, for both of this, both of these categories, the, the report uses um, data um, from the, the uh, U.S. Forest Service. And um, the findings right now, and this, this report's going to be finalized at the end of the year, but, but um, just draft findings have been shared in, in a, a public process to, to develop input for that report. Um, what we're seeing is, is, you know, currently removals of carbon um, by the, in, in, you know, wood products and, and our forests, um, give us about 30 million metric tons a year of carbon removals. And that, that, that equals approximately 8% of annual greenhouse gas emissions. So if we are to get to a point where we're offsetting that final 15%, you know, think the difference between 85% emission reduction and 100% carbon neutrality, we would need to double that um, level of, of sequestration. But the problem is, you know, the removals have declined um, since 1990. So we need to, to, you know, sort of turn that around and, and develop policies um, that, that will enable us to increase the amount of sequestration. So um, I think that's, that's pretty much it for my introduction. Let me, t I guess Rob's going to go next to talk about what are some of those policies um, coming out of the the scoping plan process that would um, increase that that you know level of sequestration. Um, so I don't know, John. Do I turn it back to you or or over to? Yeah, I'll take it first, brief second. But we'll have Rob uh, get ready to go and line up here. But I just want to remind folks: if you have questions, be it on the process or any of the technical things that Rob and Carl do, please post them in the Q and A function on the Zoom screen. So with that, Rob Davies, please go ahead. Robin. I have kind of questionable internet, so I don't. I want to keep my bandwidth down as much as I can, so I will stop my video. Um, I am pinch hitting for uh, Peter Innes. 
He is, uh, was our assistant director in the Division of Lands and Forests and has really been the lead for our forestry office for the past year and a half or two years working uh, on the CLCPA panels, the Ag and Forestry uh, panel, and really has spearheaded a lot of the, uh, the policies that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, one of the things I did want to mention before I got started is, is uh, so Peter just retired a week ago today, which is unfortunate. But fortunately, we also have been able to hire two new, what we're calling carbon foresters in the Division of Lands and Forests, uh, Brian Ellis and Molly Hassett. And I just wanted to thank Brian and Molly right out of the box here. Uh, they, they helped me a great deal in putting this uh, presentation together, where I'm going to, as Jared said, focus on our forests and the forestry sector and, and how we're going to uh, need to be contributing towards this net neutrality uh, in carbon that, that is demanded under the CLCPA and the policies and the programs that we can, that we're thinking about and considering and proposing to try to get us there because it is a challenge. Next slide. So as a quick overview of what I will cover today, um, I'm just gonna briefly go over the status of our forest today. Some of the factual uh, uh, information about our New York State forest um, and going over the five forestry recommendations that came out of the Ag and Forestry Panel. That's keeping forests as forests, improving our forest management, afforestation, reforestation, urban forestry, and bioeconomy. Next slide. This is a summary of the uh, CLCPA targets that Jared's already gone over in detail. Essentially, you know, what is needed, we eventually need to get 100% carbon neutrality and, and, and how is, how are our forests going to contribute towards that goal? Next slide. So we need to focus on how our incredible forest resource in New York State can be and, and must be uh, part of the carbon solution. Um, unfortunately, we're kind of trending in the wrong direction. We've got to reverse that and we've got to go in the op opposite direction in a significant way. We have about 18.6 million acres of forest land today. Uh, that's down a bit in the past 10 years. That still equals about one acre for every New York state resident in the state of New York. 63% uh, of our state is forested. New York state's uh, about 30 million acres. Uh, we have a significantly more forest today than we did 100 years ago. Uh, but as Jared has mentioned, and I've said, is our forests have seen a decrease in the last 10 years. That decrease we feel is mostly from development and agriculture. 74%, even, even in New York State, where we have a significant uh, public ownership of our forest lands, 74% uh, of our forests, or 13.6 million acres, are privately owned. Uh, and if we are going to really turn the dial, make an impact, on uh, carbon, then we're going to uh, we're going to need to be able to come up with policies and programs that directly impact uh, those 13.6 million acres. Um, 3.1 million acres of forest preserve, um, 790, about 800,000 acres of our state forests. We also have 900,000 acres of conservation easement, but those are still in private ownership. So that's part of the 74%. Next slide. Uh, a brief overview of the carbon cycle, which is thought of as a, a closed loop um, where trees grow and sequester carbon. Um, it's gonna be an important cycle if we're going to get that last 15 percent that Jared's talking about. Uh, the younger forests do sequester carbon faster than the older mature forests. Uh, CO2 does get released in this cycle due to fire, decomposition, land conversion, uh, insect and diseases. 
And harvests are necessary for several reasons. One, they, they do create durable wood products that store carbon long-term. That's something that has to be part of the equation. And these harvests also open up new growing space for, for uh, new trees and new forests to grow, which is you know, regeneration, which is critical uh, for our future and in this carbon cycle. Next slide. As I said, there are five forestry uh, recommendations currently in the scoping plan, like draft scoping plan from the CAC Ag and Forestry panel. Um, this graph, I think, really demonstrates what Jared was talking about in terms of the need for us to double. It's, it's actually, we, we really need to more than double our carbon sequestration from current levels. Uh, this, this graph demonstrates the, the uh, daunting task that we've got before us and the critical need for coming up with programs and policies that are really going to change this, this graph. Uh, as you can see, we were at about 30 million metric tons in 1990. We dropped in 2018. 2030, we got to get back to that 30 uh, million metric ton mark. And uh, in 2050, we've, we need to reach 60 million metric tons uh, needed for the net zero. This includes all of our ag lands, wetlands, uh, harvested wood products uh, that are based on the productivity of, of our forests in New York and the achievable afforestation and reforestation goals. Um, so this chart demonstrates 60 million metric tons we feel that a goal of 40 million metric tons is really more realistic, uh, but I'll get into that a little bit more. Next slide. Our first recommendation for keeping forests is forests. Um, this, this map here uh, shows you where uh, our, our largest areas of forest carbon sequestration and storage is happening. These dark green areas show, um, shown are our largest carbon stores. You got the Adirondacks, that's the big area in the northern part of the state. Tug Hill just to the west of the Adirondacks. The Catskills in the southern tier and then off in the southwest, the Alleghenies. Um, the lighter areas on the map show our areas of opportunity and and this also happens to be where most of our private forest ownership is, right? So if we're going to increase carbon storage and sequestration, these lighter areas on this map is really where we need to be focused. Next slide. Part of our strategy to keep forests as forests includes uh, and involves land acquisition. In New York State, we have a strong history of land conservation. We need to continue that into the future, including both fee and conservation easements. It would involve all hands on deck, like Jared said, still being the state involvement heavily, but we need to be working more with our municipalities and land trusts and the local governments need to be a key partner. We have to, we have to work with our local governments to give them the tools to develop comprehensive plans for natural resource protection within their communities. We're, we've been working at DEC and in the Div Division of Lands and Forest to develop some of those programs. Recently, we uh, came out, two years ago, we came out with a community forest program, which we're rolling out this year for the first time, and a conservation easement for land trust program, which is giving uh, acquisition funding to our land trust partners which are significant. We have a very, very strong land trust partner or land trust presence in New York State. This will give them uh, the monetary resources to actually acquire conservation easements on the ground and hold those easements themselves, where typically land trust would acquire and hope that the state would take them out. The conservation easements for land trust actually will provide the funding directly to the land trust organizations to make those acquisitions directly and hold those easements. This is really important because that 
this is the new future and, and important next stage or next phase of land conservation in New York State. I believe it's going to be the smaller, more local natural resources that need to be the focus of our conservation attention. Those parcels and those resources don't typically fit neatly within our DEC and state ownership. So we need to create the tools to help our local municipalities and our land, trust, land trusts um, acquire those important natural resources that are in their backyards. Next slide. Real property tax incentives. We've had a 480A program for over 50 years uh, in New York State. The, uh, the scoping plan has uh, recommendations uh, regarding the forest tax law. The, uh, we've recognized for a long time that the 480A tax law really needed to, needs to be amended uh, and updated. Some of the things that the scoping plan are recommending that we revise 480A, we reduce penalties, uh, we include some non-forest, no harvest lands that could be considered eligible uh, within that program, which is not currently in, in the existing program. We're also talking about creating a new 480B, which drops the minimum acreage from 50 to 25 acres. Again, also allowing for non-forested land uh, to be included and have minimum carbon stocking and also not require harvests, which currently the, the current 480A tax law program does require harvesting. And importantly, the tax reduction being based on the years that the landowner is willing to commit their lands to. So the longer they're committing their lands into the tax law program, the higher their tax reduction. And a new 480C program, which is specifically gonna be targeted for carbon, uh, again, dropping the acreage to 25 is being proposed, minimum carbon stocking to qualify. You need to develop a forest carbon management plan prepared by a certified carbon forester. And again, tax reduction based on the years of commitment, which would even be higher than what we're proposing for 480B. Next, player. Next slide. Um, one regulatory recommendation. So most of the uh, recommendations that have come out and that are in the scoping plan rely on incentives and voluntary based programs. This is the one regulatory recommendation that has come out and it's a regulation of the loss of forest. Um, it's critical to protecting the state's carbon sequestration potential especially when considering the lag in the establishment of afforestation, another strategy, but there, it takes a long time for that. This would be modeled after our New York State wetland law, and it would avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts to forests from development, and that's all development. Agriculture is proposed to be exempt due to the annual flux of working lands that, from ag to forestry that happens quite often, and agriculture is not considered a permanent conversion like typical development. Next slide. Uh, the last recommendation for keeping forests as forest strategy involves the development of carbon markets. Um, there may be a, a benefit for New York forest landowners as a means to implement responsible forestry or protecting our forests from conversion, keeping forests as forests. This is most important for New York private forest owners as they own 73% of our forests or 74%. Uh, new programs like the Nature Conservancy's Family Forest Carbon Program uh, may provide an example and an opportunity to New York landowners in the future. So we'll have to see how that continues to develop. Next slide. The next recommendation in the draft scoping plan is improved forest management. New York forests face many challenges to increase carbon sequestration uh, within our current forest areas. So impacts from invasive species, our aging forests, and historic high grading, which we're seeing on the landscape more and more, limit our current forest ability to sequester carbon at the highest possible rate. 
Next slide. So forest health, what can we do to improve our management regarding forest health? Insect diseases and invasive species threaten our New York forests uh, and combating them is critical when combating climate change. We're at the epicenter, unfortunately, of a lot of these in infestations and they can be quite devastating. We've seen the impacts from the emerald ash borer. We're essentially going to lose our ash species in New York. Uh, Hemlock woolly adelgid, which we're seeing significant impacts from, and other invasives. Um, these tend to reduce our forest productivity and they increase tree mortality. Lands and Forests has a relatively new Bureau of Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health, which is focused on this and works with uh, some very strong partners all across the state, uh, dealing and trying to mitigate the impacts from these threats, which is critical for protecting our current and future forests and carbon storage and sequestration. Next slide. Improving silviculture and restoration. Um, that's the next strategy for improved uh, forest management. Um, talked about it already. We need to reduce or eliminate high grading, which has been uh, unfortunately practiced heavily across the landscape in New York. We need to have more outreach to landowners to educate them on the importance of good forest management. We need carbon training for our foresters. And we need incentives to improve regeneration. We have tremendous deer overbrowsing in certain parts of the state where there is literally zero revegetation potential. Uh, and we have serious competing vegetation problems towards regeneration. It's one of the reasons that three years ago, DEC recreated a new program called Regenerate New York. Uh, Regenerate New York uh, provided about $450,000 in assistance to New York landowners. Uh, last year for reforestation, afforestation, and improved forest management. Um, in this map, the red to dark green areas are showing the regeneration of insecurity. Um, most of the state is either in regeneration failure or insecure with only a small area that's in the northeastern section of the Adirondacks of having secure and regeneration. Without secure regeneration, future forests uh, could be threat threatened in the event of natural disasters or other events where the overstory is lost. And as I've said, high grading and high graded stands limit the current and future sequestration of forests. Next slide. The next strategy from the scoping plan is afforestation and reforestation. Um, New York's forest sequestration rate decreased, Jared mentioned this, uh, decreased about 3.5 million metric tons since 1990 due to the decrease in forest land area and a decrease in forest productivity due to the aging forests. Our forests are aging, they're maturing out. Uh, leading to a need to increase our forest area statewide to meet ambitious climate goals. Next slide. Aforestation and reforestation. TNC's reforestation calculations and plan have calculated that a maximum, and we think an unrealistic acreage for aforestation in New York is almost 4 million acres. There are currently about 1.7 million acres of underutilized farmlands that could be an opportunity. However, planting trees is extremely expensive. It's time consuming, uh, especially for hardwoods. And you need to tend to these trees when you're planting them. You can't just throw them in the ground and walk away. Uh, for reference, in regards to the scale that we're talking about that's needed here for afforestation, is that back in the 1930s, the uh, CCC army that we had put in place planted about 300,000 acres. Um, current estimates show a need to reforest at least 1.7 million acres to combat forest loss 
and an improved sequestration. Uh, the level of planting that we're talking about um, needs to be taken into context. Our, our nursery, we have one state nursery in Saratoga for tree seedlings. They produce about 900,000 to 1 million seedlings a, a year. Uh, we're talking, we need to have billions of trees on millions of acres that will be needed. This is at a, a scale that we've never seen before. Next slide. Urban forestry, that's our, the next recommendation in the plan. Uh, sequestration is needed on every square inch we can find in the state right now. And urban areas need to be part of that equation. Next slide. Urban forestry. Um, we need to increase the tree canopy coverage in the urban and suburban environments. Uh, by tree planting and improved maintenance of the tree resources. Maintenance is key when you're talking about urban forestry. Um, and, and, and the benefits go far beyond our carbon benefits. There are the additional co-benefits are substantial. We, we have the heat island effect that trees in urban areas help reduce energy costs and they bring the ability to focus on improving the environment uh, and health in low income areas. So we need to increase grant programs, funds that are needed for planning, planting and maintenance in urban areas. We need to increase training and recruitment of necessary tree care professionals. And we need youth tree corps to provide staffing and job opportunities concentrated in EJ communities. These challenges are significant. Most urban and community trees are on private lands. So we have to include the landowners in the development of our programs. Uh, planting stock availability, as I said, that's a real challenge uh, for us right now. We need, we need trees to plant and we don't have them right now. And we need to include communities in urban tree planting efforts to buy in and help meet community goals. Next slide. The last set of recommendations has to do with bioeconomy. Uh, next slide. Jared uh, talked, I think, somewhat about this already. Um, this is really about the need to substitute wood for higher carbon materials such as concrete, steel, and plastic. Um, so we have durable wood products that store carbon for a long time. We need to be exploring. Uh, and doing more research on biochemical projects. We need research into new uses for forests and wood products. And we really need to be sensitive to and focused on expanding wood product markets. You can't, you can't achieve these uh, goals without having markets. You need markets to manage. Without, it, without markets, you, you really struggle to manage. Um, and, you know, wood, the, the reason that we're, we need to do this is that wood can provide a substitution benefit by replacing products that emit high levels of greenhouse gases in their production. And that's what this, this chart is, uh, is showing. This chart is from Bob Malsheimer, a professor at SUNY ESF from his Forest Management Solutions for Mitigating Climate Change. Uh, the chart shows the carbon footprint of different construction materials compared to wood uh, and the benefits of using uh, wood construction materials over them, over those materials. Next slide. Uh, thanks, thank you. I think that's the uh, end of my presentation. We'll have questions at the, uh, the end and I hand it back to you, John. Yeah, Rob, thank you. And I know I asked for questions to be at the end, but one that uh, came up that might trigger additional questions was, could you explain what high grading is? What high grading is? Yes. Very briefly. Uh, take I, taking the best and re leaving the rest. Where where high grading? You go in typically by a logger. Um, goes into a, a woodlot, a, a forest stand, and removes all the the, the genetically the the best genetic. Uh, 
resources in there and leaving really a depleted, uh, non-diverse uh, wood stand behind. And okay. that's what we've been seeing across the state. It kind of leads to what we call the, the green lie, <laughs> where you, you can look at a forest and, and it looks green, but that does not mean that we, it's a healthy, resilient, uh, diverse forest ecosystem, which is what we really strive for when high grading depletes all of that. Okay, thank you. I just wanted, because there'll probably be other questions or comments associated with that. So Carl, Carl from uh, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority and doing the integration analysis. Take it over, Carl. Great. Uh, thank you, John, for moderating. Um, and thank you, uh, Melanie and Dan, for hosting. Um, let me see here. I'm looking to share. And for some reason, my sharing isn't popping up. Give me one second. There it is. Hopefully, John, you can see that now. Yes, it's coming up. Yep, there it is. Perfect. Okay. Um, again, thank you all for um, having having us here um, to share with you some of these draft findings from the Climate Action Council scoping plan. As Jared mentioned, he did a great overview of the process. This is all still draft material that our scoping plan is um, is a work in progress. So, so the council is thinking through these inputs. Um, and, and to be clear, the, the work of this integration analysis I'm going to share with you is, is but what in, one input into the process. Um, and so any scenario outputs that we share um, are, are not the plan itself, but instead seek to inform our council members as they consider policy options for the state. Um, also, as, as uh, Jared uh, mentioned, this work builds from our advisory panels um, who spent many months um, both last year and in the beginning of, of this year. Um, it was over 100 stakeholders um, across all sectors of the economy. Um, so a very large group of folks who we were able to glean new insights from. We also have a separate group of technical advisors who are academics in the state who have been advising on some of the technical parts of the modeling methods that, that we're doing here. Um, the core modeling is, has been performed for New York State by E3, um, who have an analytic tool set to look at decarbonization pathways um, across different scales of, uh, of geographies. Um, there were a number of other underlying studies that we pulled into that overall meta-analysis. Um, that work was done for us by other consultants, as well as um, a number of uh, uh, state staff members. Um, a, a lot of the work, in fact, for the agriculture and forestry work came from those agencies. So DEC played an instrumental role in helping to feed our scenarios around uh, net, net sequestration from our natural and working lands, as well as some of the opportunities for mitigating emissions as did ag and markets. Um, so I really want to thank staff from uh, both of those agencies who were instrumental um, in giving us the opportunity to look at an economy-wide analysis. Um, so with that, um, let's, let's, let's dive in. I'm going to try to wrap up um, before the end of the hour. So I'll be moving a little bit quickly through my slides. Um, I'm going to give an overview of some of the key findings and kind of a little bit of, um, I think, some, some important information on the actual underlying methods that the CLCPA calls for. I think it's really important um, for everyone to understand them, but certainly this audience to understand how biogenic and how bioenergy systems are being treated. Um, I hope to get through most of the economy-wide results summary. The sectoral results, I've curated um, a few slides at the end just to do a deeper dive into some of what I think are some of the key sectors that you all might care about. Uh, we won't probably have time to get into those, but I have shared these slides um, with John and others. And so hopefully those can be shared with, with you all. All of this uh, work has already been presented uh, to our council. So it was October 1st and, and October 14th. So you can go to our website at climate.ny.gov um, to see both meeting all the meeting slides from, from the council we also have a separate resources page that I show here that will be growing over time. Um, and so, for example, you'll see that we have posted some detailed Excel spreadsheets that give key drivers for some of our assumptions, as well as some of the PowerPoint slides that we've already shared with the council members. Uh, we'll also be posting links to some of the key supporting studies. So um, it's important to know where we're starting from, um, right? You can't um, manage what you don't measure. 
Um, and so it's really important work that DEC is doing that, that Jared mentioned around our inventory. Um, what we've pulled together is a, is, is a draft set of results in order to inform our analysis. This won't be final until the end of year, um, but we anticipate that this story will ring true um, when we read our final inventory. Um, so a couple key takeaways, buildings and transportation are over half of our overall emissions. Um, of those uh, space heating and light duty passengers, so that's the cars and light trucks that we all drive, um, those are the dominant sources of CO2 emissions. Um, you'll see that our um, electric uh, generation system is, is next, um, and closely behind that is our waste system. So those two, um, when they combined with buildings and transport, are over 75%. Most of electric gen in New York right now is natural gas, which is a small amount of oil that we use for peaker plants. Um, and then from waste, most of that is methane from our, our landfills. And uh, next slide, I'll get into um, why methane is such an important emission source, especially in the accounting that we have now in New York. Um, these colors are shown in, in the bar graph just to give you a total stack up. You see there we have roughly 400 million metric tons of emissions. We also have our forestry at the bottom. So that's the net sequestration, as has been mentioned now a couple of times. It's around 30 million metric tons. Um, and then the bar graph on the right shows how the gases break down. So historically, when we've looked at using some of the old methods, um, we've seen that CO2 is, is the dominant source of emissions. So that's mostly from combustion of fossil fuels. We have some new accounting practices that are called for in the CLCPA, which put the, their thumb on the scale on counting methane as more as a short-lived but very potent greenhouse gas. Um, so methane is actually a very large part of our carbon footprint now uh, under this new accounting. So roughly 60% is CO2, and then the rest is methane and N2O and HFCs. Um, again, you'll see the, uh, the net sink is, uh, is a, a sequestration in the dark blue of CO2. So again, not to get too bogged down in, in the accounting, um, but it's really critical. Um, so I hope you all can walk away with, with an understanding of how New York is now looking at greenhouse gases. Um, so many states and federal governments around the world use what are the, the kind of standard IPCC protocols that the, uh, in, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which looks at a 100-year time horizon uh, for the global warming potential. Um, and as part of that accounting system, they do a net accounting on bio uh, on uh, biogenic systems, so looking at biomass, wood products, biodiesel, renewable natural gas, um, and deem them to be carbon neutral because they're able to comprehensively look at the sinks and the uh, sources, and they look at how the change of the net sink over time, and that's where any accounting would happen from a global perspective. They would deem the combustion of biomass to be carbon neutral, and they would look at the land areas. And if, if there's an unsustainable harvest, we would show a carbon loss in our land areas. Um, so what the uh, CLCPA has done is it's changed some of that accounting for the geography of New York. And it's in three critical areas. The first one is in the global warming potential. Um, and so what we've seen is we, we've adopted a 20 year global warming potential. And so the time horizon, again, dictates the lens by which you look at the global warming impact of gases. And what we have on this chart, just to give you an illustration of what it means, is that methane in our old accounting was around 30 times more potent than CO2. In our new accounting, it's now 90, almost 90 times. So it, it, it's 84 times. Um, so it's a substantial growth in the weight in which we put on methane emissions. And that's why landfills are a much larger piece of our carbon footprint now. Maybe more important for this group is the treatment of biogenic CO2. So that's any CO2 that comes from the burning of any biogenic products, whether it be solid biomass like wood and pellets or liquid biofuels like ethanol and, and uh, uh, biodiesel. Um, and so what the law calls for us to do is to actually count the overall CO2 emissions that come from the combustion of these fuels. Um, and so, you know, that's an, that's an important new process by which we will no longer deem any biogenic resources as net zero. Instead, we will be counting all CO2 emissions from the combustion. We will simultaneously be looking at land use changes and counting any sequestration that happens over time. So in our netting, when we look at carbon neutrality, we're able, at least for within New York, um, if, if, for example, we're able to capture methane from waste, 
Um, it means that we reduce those methane emissions from that waste stream. If we then burn it and turn it into CO2 um, in the form of heat, we will be counting those CO2 emissions. Um, so on net, that would be a net drop in the overall CO2 or GHG emissions, but we will be counting each molecule of CO2. Um, the, the, the final pillar of the unique approach that New York is taking is we are, again, per the CLC EPA, counting all upstream emissions from fossil fuel combustion. Um, and so what we now have done and what DEC has worked on, and the next slide will show some numbers, is to do life cycle analysis or total fuel cycle analysis to look at, for example, the upstream methane emissions from natural gas systems. Um, so we are now making estimates of the, the methane emissions from the wellhead out of state and attributing those to the use of natural gas in state. And that has a very large impact on the carbon footprint. Um, so just to unpack that a little bit more of the GHG accounting for fuels. Um, so the left column here, so we have each row with our different fuel types. The left column was what we call our June 2020 accounting. So that's the accounting that we used to do for all of our pr previous pathways work and previous inventory work. So you see, for example, natural gas has 117 pounds per MMBTU of CO2 emission. A renewable natural gas product was zero. It was deemed to be carbon neutral. The column on the right is the new draft CLCPA accounting. And you see there's a range on natural gas because there's uncertainty in what the actual upstream um, uh, methane emissions are. But you'll see a substantial growth in natural gas up to 215. So growing from 117 to 215 pounds of CO2 equivalent per MMBTU. So substantial growth. Um, and what that means now is natural gas is equivalent to distillate fuels like, heal, like home heating oil and like diesel. Um, and so that's, that's a very different paradigm than we've had in the past. And it has implications on how we do accounting today. It has implications on how the, uh, the uh, path we've taken since 1990. So over the years, we've shifted from coal, we've shifted from distillate fuels into natural gas. And we had previously thought we were going to be earning a carbon benefit from that fuel switch. And what we see from the new accounting is that we have not. Um, and so it calls on us, therefore, to be even more aggressive as we look to the future to, to decarbonize faster. Um, and then the other one, obviously, to be clear on is that our biogenic resources are no longer deemed carbon neutral. So you see that a renewable natural gas product, um, now we will count all the CO2 emissions from that. So it's now at, at 117. So some pretty profound accounting changes that ripple into all the work that we will be doing. Um, and just to look at how it's changed, um, our actual, how we think about ourselves in, in our carbon footprint. So we used to say that we had 200 million metric tons with the state's carbon footprint. And CERDA has managed that inventory now for over a decade, working closely with DEC. Um, and that was, again, a, uh, that was an economy-wide look, so not just energy. Um, and what we've done is just to illustrate the impact, um, we've layered on each of these three pillars and how they've changed our accounting. And you'll see that Switching our global warming potential from a 100-year framework to a 200 has increased our carbon footprint by nearly 70 million metric tons. You'll see the large growth is in that orange, which is our waste methane emission. Um, the next step was then to start counting our biogenic CO2. It's a smaller impact on our footprint, but it's over 10 million metric tons of emissions that we're now counting that we haven't in the past. And then the final one, which is the largest, is the increase from the upstream fossil fuel emissions. So you see it's nearly 90 million metric tons that we've added to our accounting for our carbon footprint. So we've grown all told from 200 in the old accounting to nearly 400 million metric tons. Okay, so with that, I want to pivot from kind of where we are today and how we're thinking about the math of greenhouse gases into some of the key findings from our scenario analysis. And I'll to give you an overview of what those scenarios are. Again, these are draft key findings that came from our recent pathways work. Um, this is feeding into the scoping plan process. Um, and so I'll try to emphasize just given the time and I, I'm seeing I'm actually having to move faster, so I will. Um, I'm gonna really try to emphasize some of the ones that are most relevant for this group. So clearly in order to achieve our, our, our emission reductions um, per the law, we have to um, look at novel emissions accounting, and that has impacts, and it's showing us that every sector has to see high levels of transformation. This isn't about one sector being able to, to not have a deep transformation. This is an all-hands-on-deck, as, as Jared mentioned. 
Um, a core pillar is energy efficiency and end use electrification. It's true for all pathways that we've, that we've modeled. We also see there needs to be a substantial reduction in vehicle miles of travel. Um, we see for the grid, it's gonna be a, a grid dominated by wind, water, and sunlight. So the electricity that we use for our lighting and in the future for our heating and for our transportation will come from predominantly from those sources. But in particular relevance, I think for this group is we will need a substantial amount of we, what we call firm zero emission resources. So those are resources that we can control and that they will be able to come on when the wind and the sun are, are, are not available. And there are a few technologies that we have a line of sight to now, one of being green hydrogen, you may have seen in the press. Um, there's the possibility of something like RNG that could also be near zero emissions. Um, there's also new technologies on the horizon um, that are so-called long duration storage, where you can actually do seasonal storage. Um, so some of those technologies that are coming out of labs right now are based on metal air technologies where we could see hundreds of hours of energy storage. Low carbon fuels such as bioenergy and hydrogen may play a critical role. And while we are electrifying our system heavily, we still think they're gonna be very hard to electrify end uses. And that's where these low carbon fuels will, we think will play an important role. Um, and then just um, kind of wrapping up on some of the key takeaways, we, obviously, natural working lands are critical to our equation. Um, it's been very well said by the previous two speakers. We're around 30 million metric tons today. We think an aggressive scenario could get us up to 40. We need 60. And so I'll speak to how we think that gap might be filled. Um, but large scale carbon sequestration opportunities in lands and forests, in addition to negative emission technologies. So that's where we would actually do direct air capture out of the atmosphere to sequester chemically and physically CO2. Um, obviously, we've spent a lot of time already today talking about protecting and growing New York's forests. It's going to be absolutely critical for carbon neutrality. And we're also going to need to think holistically about the, uh, our strategic land use planning, because now we're balancing you know, traditional development pressures um, for housing um, with growing our, our forests, with continuing to have food and fiber coming off of the land, and increasingly using land for electricity generation in solar and wind farms. So it's part of a holistic approach that you know, we will be initiating those conversations through the council process, but it will take years for us to think about how to best use and maximize um, how working in natural lands can give us all these cool benefits. Um, and what we see in terms of additional innovation, we need to be thinking about new ways of doing carbon sequestration. One of that, much of that may fall within our agricultural practices where we can have a more re resilient farming industry and one that, that sequesters more carbon. Um, and when we look at the largest remaining sources, it's landfills, it's aviation, so airplanes, and animal feeding actually is one of the large sources of, of emissions that are going to be tough to get out. Um, a bottom line in terms of the key uh, benefit and cost analysis that we released last week, um, when we look at all the incremental costs of this large transition over 30 years, um, we see that, and we weigh those against all of the, all the benefits of making these changes, and that's benefits in terms of avoiding climate change impacts, it's benefits in terms of all the health co-benefits. We see that the benefits far out, out seed the cost. Um, in other words, that the cost of inaction, the cost of doing nothing and letting the business as usual continue exceeds the cost of the actions that are on, on the table through, through, through these different scenarios. Just to give you a quick sense, you know, across our two core scenarios, the net cost is around $300 billion over these 30 years, and the net benefit we're seeing is over $400 billion. Um, and to give you a little bit of context to think about what those net, net costs are, um, it's hard to think about huge investments over 30 years. When we look at those investments in annual snapshots, in 2030, it's around $10 billion, which is less than 1% of the state's gross state product. Um, and we look out to 2050, it's around $50 billion, and that's around 2% of our growth state product. Um, so I'm going to do probably just a couple minutes just to kind of walk you through our scenarios and, and, and some of the key findings. And again, I'll be able to share these slides, and, um, and we can do some of the Q&A, which I think is, is as important as, as me speaking to you. Um, so we had two core scenarios that I'm going to, that we presented to the council. I'll focus on this scenario two today, which was, as I mentioned, a, a, a strategic use of low carbon fuels. Um, and so what we see across all our scenarios 
is, you know, our reference case is the black line. So that's our existing policies. Um, our, our limits per the law in 2030 are 246 million metric tons. Our reference case shows that we can bend the curve and get to 332, but we still had a substantial gap. So our scenarios have sequentially looked at how to close that gap and have a more aggressive set of programs. Um, and what we're analyzing here is what it would take, you know, with the scoping plan, we'll then have to translate is how do we make those happen? In 2050, our limit is, um, is around um, 60 million metric tons. And again, our business as usual reference case would get us to just over 300. So a substantial bending of the curve is, is still needed. Um, and so this is our reference case trajectory over time. You'll see that the green shrinks the most. That's our electric system as we decarbonize our grid per the law. Um, but we have substantial emissions out into the future business as usual. Um, and so as we bend the curve in our scenario two, as an example, we see that we substantially shrink emissions in all sectors. You'll see in the end, we're growing our, our forests. In addition, we're going to need these nets, these negative emission technologies to close the gap and get it to the 16 million metric tons in order to have a carbon neutral economy. And as you'll see in the colors in 2050, as I mentioned before, we see some of the hardest to decarbonize sectors are the, are the waste system, our aviation, um, and then there's agriculture and industry. Um, so to give you a snapshot on what the system will look like over time, this is a focus on energy. Um, the graph on the left is the actual energy in the units of uh, uh, trillion BTUs. So that's um, a British unit. One BTU is burning of one match. So that's 3,000 trillion matches are what we use today every year um, for everything from heating our homes to keeping our lights on. Um, and again, this is the final energy to driving our cars, um, driving our trucks you'll see that we substantially shrink the amount of final energy we're gonna need. And much of that's predicated on the switch to, to heating our homes and driving on electricity. So we envision our, across all scenarios, at least a 70% share of electricity in our economy for, for our final energy. And that's an inherently more efficient system. So when you drive an electric vehicle, you're using much less energy than when you're burning gasoline in an equivalent vehicle. We see an important role in this scenario for, for bioenergy products. Um, in the end state, predominantly around aviation, um, where we can use, you know, high energy intensity fuels to help fly our planes. We see hydrogen could potentially play around a 10% share of our final energy mix. And along the way, we're seeing a role for other bioenergy products that can allow us to begin to bend the curve on emissions. So our bioenergy framework, and I may just end on this slide given the time, but um, I have a couple of slides that you can dig into. But what we looked at in terms of bioenergy were the feedstock supply from DOE's billion ton study. Um, we've done our own potential studies over the years to look at in-state, you know, looking at waste products, looking at potentially dedicated energy crops. Um, and we've adjusted what we found based on our advisory panel input and the academic partners from SUNY ESF and Cornell who have been able to feed into the process. Um, we've allocated feedstocks across different end uses, um, partly based on the final fuels, um, what their production costs are. So these will not be cheap fuels in many cases. Um, so we have to look at what their costs will be in the long run, what the displaced fossil fuel will cost, um, and then what the abatement potential is. And so what, for example, we've seen that RNG actually on a per BTU basis has the most displaced carbon abatement when it can displace natural gas because of the upstream emissions from our natural gas system. Um, so those are some of the core principles that we've used to think about how to allocate biofuels. And across our different scenarios, we've looked at different volumes for this scenario two that I focused on. We did look at what our share might be of regional feedstocks. Uh, and really we've focused on waste products. We've looked at residues from our, our forest system and looked at a small amount of purpose grown biomass. We juxtapose that against another scenario three, where we looked at trying to minimize the amount of combustion and really targeting wastewater and landfills that are gonna be emitting methane anyway, and not looking at any uh, purpose-grown biomass. So we've got a couple of different lenses that we've brought to our council to look at the role of bioenergy. Um, so that was a bit of a whirlwind tour, um, but I hope it gives you a snapshot of some of the key findings um, and the role that we do think low carbon fuels can play strategically um, in our future. We think it will be a highly electrified system that's predicated on wind, water, and solar energy. 
Um, and solar energy being stored in the form of bioenergy and hydrogen, we think could play a, a strategic role in that future. Um, so with that, John, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. I know we're at the hour. Um, hopefully we have at least 15, 20 minutes where we can go through some of the questions. We do, we definitely do. And uh, I think what I'll do is start to sort through some of these questions uh, and, and can you all see them, uh, the, pa the panelists? So I hope you can, but- I'll, yeah, I'll... Maybe if you can read off key ones. Yeah. That would so be I'm gonna go to the first one there. There's some evidence that warmer, wetter soil conditions are increasing the decomposition rate of soil organic matter in forested lands. One of the byproducts of decomposition is CO2. Does the carbon sequestration approach in New York State adequately account for negative feedbacks such as those from soil? Does anybody? I mean, I have a bit of an answer to that. I think one of the hardest things we have is we don't have a lot of really good information about forest soils and below ground carbon and what's ultimately happening. And I know that that is one of the strong research recommendations that came out of the forestry panel. Um, certainly there is a significant role of below ground uh, carbon and, and the ability to sequester, but also the ability to have emissions. Um, but the answer, I think the answer is we don't really have the same level of science on forest soils that we do on agricultural soils. I don't know, Bob, Jared, do you have anything on that? No, John, I, I reached out to our experts when I saw that question come in and I haven't yet heard from them. Okay. So if, if an answer comes in, in the next uh, 20 it. minutes, I'll, I'll pass it on. Yeah. But Yeah, okay. well, I, I will say that we've just begun and I would say it's a first step to look at the interaction between a changing climate and our decarbonization strategies. So as an example, not specific to this question, we are looking at warmer summers and more air conditioning load and thinking about those interactions. Um, I, I do know we have some great academics in the state who are thinking about what the future of soil carbon and forest carbon will be. We also in parallel have a separate climate change assessment that will be wrapping up in about a year and a half, but we'll be looking at our vulnerabilities to climate change. And we will have a focus on working lands and natural lands and, and how, what the climate change impacts will be. And the idea here is this is a conversation that we're starting. And so we'll be iterating on these scenarios as we begin to think about what, what the climate impacts will be. Great, thank you. So uh, another question is uh, is going to a comment Jared make, uh, mentioning a 10% decline associated with forest loss and reduced productivity. Can that decline be refined to separate change in land use, forest to non-forest versus reduced productivity? What's causing the reduced productivity? I think Rob, you touched on that in your presentation. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a little bit of all the above. I mean, the latest FIA data that we got in from the Forest Service, which is done on a seven-year rotation rotational basis, showed New York State actually lost 340,000 acres of forest. Um, we think that most of that is from development, conversion of land uh, from development and agriculture. Uh, but obviously, we, we also have a, a maturing forest, which leads to a decline uh, in sequestration and productivity. So uh, it's, it's a little bit of the, all the above. Um, one of the questions that came in a different way to me, came through a text to me, but I'll, because it adds on this, is New York considering uh, uh, a regulatory factor on citing renewable energy resources on agriculture and forests, similar to that that's done in Vermont, where they're attempting to steer away the loss of agricultural and forest lands due to renewable energy siting. Yeah, so I can start off and then I'd be happy to see if Jared and others have other thoughts. So we're, we're actively engaged in discussions, especially around agricultural lands. So we have stood up um, a new agriculture um, energy task force that's looking at um, potential rules and regulations around how to best optimize you know, our continued strong agricultural industry and culture around working lands um, with the ability to grow our solar and wind resources. And so you know, we firmly believe we can have both and it's just a matter of careful planning. Okay, uh, here's, here's a, Similar question, to regulate the loss of forest land, will regulations be tied to local zoning and planning law? 
If not, local governments may still opt for development. Rob, you touched on that in your- Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it, it needs to be similar to what I said, the wetlands law. It needs to be a statewide law. I don't think it can be left, you know, this, th we've, we've got a big lift ahead of us. So we've got to be consistent and, and unified. And so that requires a statewide approach. Um, and because uh, I, I believe, I think it was Hugh who asked that question. I, I think he was right. Yeah. A lot of communities would probably opt for development. Um, but I, I will also say, I am seeing more and more, like, you know, where I sit in my chair uh, in the director of lands and forests, I am seeing more and more communities reaching out, wanting the tools to be able to protect really important resources in their communities uh, that they see vulnerable to development that you know, really changes the character of these communities. Um, and we're trying to develop those programs to give them those tools. Okay. Um, this one, I'm not sure. This is probably for Jared, but is there an estimate of time on the scoping plan until we reach carbon neutral foresting, forestry? Well, the goal is is a carbon neutral economy by 2050, yeah. and that's what the the Climate Action Council is is planning towards. Um, you know, the the sequestration in the forests will contribute to that goal. I mean, the sequestration in the forest more than outweighs any emissions from forestry. So it's not really a question of carbon neutral forestry. It's the contribution of forestry to a carbon neutral economy. Okay, building on that, I, I, um, there was a question here. Uh, I wanna get to it. Okay. There was a question uh, for Carl on this, but maybe Jared as well. Can you speak to the option of low quality wood products being used for bioelectricity in the state? Yeah, so under the uh, new accounting, we will be counting every molecule of CO2 that comes out of any combustion, whether it be for electricity or for heat. Um, so that is part of our overall carbon footprint. Um, so what we need to think about is how to do the full and comprehensive accounting. So, for example, if it's a waste product, if it's from a sawmill and they're making pellets for heat, you know, what would have happened anyway with those pellets or, or with that uh, sawdust? And if it will decompose, um, I think, we, you know, we're going to need to take a step back as we think about individual policies and how we do carbon accounting. Um, so our measurement will be looking at every molecule. As we think about individual policies and how we fund changes in the state, we'll be needing to look at, you know, what is the, what is the net story for an individual feedstock as it makes its way to an energy service? That's an interesting, and then maybe, maybe you answered this question that was put up, but how can you give a standard CO2 emissions for biofuels when the sourcing, the carbon impact of the source material is part of the equation? and as unique to each system. And I think you just kind of answered that as to how you're gonna do that. Yeah, I hope so. And, I, I, and there's some nuance here. So I do want us to kind of think about it, that we're counting every CO2 molecule, but as we implement policies, whether it be fuel standards or when we think about incentive programs, we'll need to holistically look at the individual feedstocks fuel cycle and think about how we want to incentivize that. So if it's grabbing waste methane that would have already been going to the atmosphere. Obviously we care about grabbing that and destroying it. And so individual policies will have to think in discrete ways. I think that's good. Um, yeah. Camera. Okay, then uh, to what extent would or could locally raised grass-fed livestock, e.g. pasture, silvo pasture, offset emissions attributed to the animal? I don't know that we have an agriculture. Yeah. So, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, I guess as a at, at a basic level, to the degree we can have more carbon sequestration in the soils. So as we're growing feed, that will grow our sink and will help us hit our 2050 goal. So we have to absolutely come up with those programs and policies. Um, if we can't do that in a smart way, we're going to have to exceed 85 percent. 
Um, and so clearly innovation around animal feed, both how it's grown and how it's consumed are going to be critical. And it's, and those are, you know, that's our 2050 challenge just to think about how we can do animal feed in a way that's both lower carbon intensity. There's some really interesting studies being done now in terms of augmenting feed with things like seaweed, um, augmenting feed with, with other products that can reduce that, um, that, that source of methane. Um, and then we need to think about how we grow the feed. And if we can make that a more of a net sink over time, it will help us to, to realize our goals. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question on cap and trade or carbon markets. Were New York State to develop a cap and trade market, how likely is it that polluters be required to offset their emissions on a scale greater than one to one? At least a two to one would be necessary to ameliorate the greenhouse gas levels rather than keep them stable as a one to one would. So I, I I saw that question come in, and I'm, I'm not sure I completely understood it. Um, you know, if we're offsetting at, you know, giving double credit to the sequestration, for example, then we're not we're we're not achieving the goal of carbon neutrality, yeah. and um, so. You know, there. I, I guess I would just say that that you know, offsetting emissions in carbon markets is is one tool. I have to point out there's some language in the CLCPA that that puts some limits on on that. Um, that's the alternative compliance mechanism language. But there's other tools that we would use to support. Um, sequestration, you know, besides offsets, and you know, those are made all the, you know, many of the policies that Rob talked about. So, um, and and so it could be the interaction of these policies that that help us achieve the level of sequestration needed. Just building on that a little bit, you know, you're, you're correct, Jared. Uh, the, those extreme limits on carbon offsets within the CLCPA, um, but our forest landowners will have the opportunity to participate in national or international carbon markets. And is there any means by which our accounting will take into consideration, you know, how many sequestration credits are being offset, carbon offsets are being exported out of New York? I mean, we've seen California actually, in its compliance mechanism, try to pull back and get more offsets within the state than outside the state. I don't know what yeah. thoughts on I, that. Is. Yeah, is that I, I, I would say I would say there, there's nothing that prevents um, you know sequestration in New York State or you know biofuels being produced in in New York State to be credited towards policies and other programs. Yeah. I also just want to make clear that 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 sequestration is available in carbon markets in New York that alternative compliance mechanism does not you know out you know out does not not say that that's that's not available it it just has some limits on our ability to use it and and particularly it's it there's a limit say, there's a language saying that the power sector the electricity sector cannot offset its emissions um you know in any way, it needs to achieve the emission reduction goals, you know, in that sector itself. So that that, you know, 100% zero emission electricity sector in 2040 um, needs to be reached by the electricity sector itself, and and you know can, cannot involve um, offsetting any of the emissions from the power sector. Okay. Um, there's a question. I think this is directed to Rob. Uh, why do younger forests sequester more carbon than older aging forests? I mean, well, they're they're growing faster, so they sequester more carbon. I do want to I, I do want to make a point. It's not to say that our younger forests. Uh, are more important than our mature forests, it, like our Adirondack and Catskill forest preserves. Those those areas are really important and uh, unique. You know, we always talk about diversity, 
having those carbon storage sinks that's you know they they're big carbon storage sinks um is really important and so we we need we need it all we want a diverse forest uh we need young forests we need middle-aged forests and we need our old mature forests and um and we most importantly need future forests and so that's why we're so focused on regeneration and afforestation and you know increasing the acreages of our forest lands uh, whether they be new or old uh, we need we need more forest land okay um, this is more a question I guess mine I would put out there um, but we know that and this is for call we know that Integration analysis is looking at co-pollutants across the sector, including also in, in the use of bioenergy and biofuels and biomass. But uh, is it also factoring in the co-benefits of forests, such as protection of water quality, wildlife, biodiversity, and whatnot, and, and trying to come to a net type of scenario? Or is that just not called? Yeah, great. No, no that's a great question. So that wasn't specified in the law, but it doesn't mean that it isn't important. Um, so that wasn't a first priority for the work that we did this fall, but absolutely the, the kind of ecosystem services that actively managed forests provide are critical for our economy and for our health. Um, and so that's a, that's a frontier space for us. And we'd love to see comments, you know, during the next year's process, if folks have some specific studies, you know, and I that we've funded in our environmental research program for example, we've looked at maple stands and kind of, you know, seen what might be some of the benefits of preserving those stands, both local economies and water quality. I think water often is the one that's been most analyzed. There have been researchers at RPI and, and UVM. Um, so it would be great if um, if this community could could bring forward case studies for us, because um, I would love to add more co-benefits, especially on our kind of management of natural working lands to speak to the fact it's not just about the carbon sink. There are a host of services that our forests provide. Yeah, and, and let me just, just add to that. I mean, you know, it certainly is a, a qualitative goal of um, this process. As I showed in one of my slides, you know, the, the, the statute itself specifically refers to the goal of achieving healthy forests. Mm -hmm. and. And so in developing the scoping plan, you know, the council can consider all these other benefits that strategies bring to bear, whether it's reducing other types of pollution, helping grow our forests, um, you know, achieving, you know, healthier communities. Um, all of those are relative are relevant to the work of the Climate Action Council might not be able to quantify those benefits, but but they're certainly there. Excellent. Um, another one that I'd, I'd put forth is uh, in some of the other advisory panels, we didn't see as much on uh, the, the uh, carbon storage through the use of harvested wood products, particularly in the construction and infrastructure arena, or the uh, substitute benefits come out as strongly. So just curious, you know, how would you have this sector and its comments start to say, hey, we can achieve still some substantial more storage benefits as well as substitution benefits. And I don't realize substitution isn't always as quantitative, but how do we influence that element of it in terms of reducing emissions or is it relatively insignificant in the bigger picture, like when it comes to construction in particular? I, I would I would say that we're we're interested in any input that um, you know that 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 stakeholders can provide on that. Um, you know, we we are still very heavily reliant on those high carbon construction materials that that you know Rob showed in one slide of of you know cement and steel, and to the extent there's strategies that can um, you know, enable the substitution of those materials with with wood, where where you know we are sequestering that wood um, in a building or in a product. You know, I, I we we 
we'd appreciate any ideas that, that, you know, people have on how to achieve and that potential and how to increase, you know, the, the, the use of wood products. And I, and I think that there's a lot of interest in research going on in terms of mass timber, right? Um, we're, we're trying to see if there are some of our Northeastern softwoods can be certified into some of those mass, uh, mass timber tall building codes uh, so that we can start utilizing those materials more. Um, you know, we talk about green buildings encouraging more green buildings using wood products versus that steel and cement uh, to the extent that we can. I think we have a huge opportunity on the, not, not necessarily right now on the production side, but on the utilization side in New York State uh, in putting those products to use uh, in, in, in our future uh, development. Yeah. And, and let, me, let me just add, you know, I saw a headline, I don't remember if it was yesterday or I think it was yesterday about a study that that plastics manufacturing is going to be surpassing in the future electricity generation as a source of emissions globally. And, you know, a lot of those plastics are used in ways that we can use wood products instead. And, um, you know, that, uh, you know, I think, again, there's a lot of potential um, for, for some creative thinking there. Yeah, maybe just one other thought. And I think it's a little bit, again, out of the problem statement that came to our ad advisory panels was not focused on the embodied emissions. So to the degree that we import durable goods and the ability for us to substitute with bio-derived products. There's not a specific accounting that we would do around that. However, our housing panel did take on that topic. And so we do expect that the scoping plan will speak to the benefits of substituting for durable goods, even if they're imported. So it's not within New York's geographic boundary of where those emissions come from. Um, we, it still will be spoken to qualitatively. And I think that's going to have to be in a future iteration. As we think about future scoping plan updates, we're going to have to get at embodied energy and, and embodied emission. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point, and and it's significantly one that could affect this sector in a very positive way. But also leads to the whole sustainability question: as we look to our forests and to yield these products that can be used as substitution or other other benefits of ensuring that we are continuing to manage our forest sustainably and maintaining our carbon stocks. And it's a fine balance between maintaining carbon stocks and then increasing sequestration. But on, on, the, on the sequestration side, um, has the recommend, have the recommendations looked to the benefits of bioenergy carbon capture and storage as a net negative emission? And do you see the mm -hmm. opportunities for that and, and how might we address it knowing that there's a lot of yeah. dense combustion, but it's combustion that's often going to yield the ability to capture and store bioenergy carbon. Yeah, right. So the, it's often has the uh, acronym BEX, um, yeah. of bioenergy carbon capture. Um, definitely substantial global research going into this. You know, we, we think, especially for our, our, our industrial end uses, where we think carbon capture will be something that um, has the potential to play a role for some of these hard to electrify end uses. We think layering on BECs would be a very value, uh, valuable net benefit, could be a net negative benefit. Um, again, it would be net negative in that it would create a new demand for forest products. So we would hopefully accelerate the amount of sequestration on our lands, and then we would be capturing that CO2 at that industrial site. So it would not be a, it would only be a small net emission from the site itself, because no perfect capture exists, but let's say we get 90, 95 capture. Um, as a system, we would see a huge net negative. Um, and for that industrial player, it would be a near zero answer because they would be capturing. Um, so that's certainly something that we want to encourage both the innovation side, you know, the, the, our ability to look at getting, you know, carbon solutions would include that as a New York funding, but really that's a global challenge, right? How do we, scale up backs globally. Great. 
Excellent. So um, we're nearing the end of the, uh, the end, mid hour that we were going to end on. And I would just like to uh, have Jared maybe close out uh, with some final points about as we go forward, you know, how, how can the forest sector and the wood product sector most effectively engage with the council, uh, particularly over the next year? Yeah, well, as, as I said, um, John, you know, we're going to be issuing the, the scoping plan for public comment at the end of this year. And um, there will be plenty of opportunities to weigh in with comment. Um, I would say in the, you know, first half of, of 2022. And so I would encourage the, you know, this sector to, to take advantage of those opportunities that will include appearing at hearings, as well as, you know, submitting written materials to the extent there's um, academic work um, going on that can inform, um, you know, some of these questions, you know, bring that to bear in that time period. Um, any input like that would be, would be appreciated and helpful. Outstanding, thank you. And, and thank you, Carl, Rob, and Jared for your time. Uh, we appreciate you taking even a little extra time on these webinar series with us. And uh, the information is a lot. There's a lot to get your head wrapped around. Uh, I think it's even gonna be bigger when we see the scoping plan. Um, so uh, we appreciate it. And I, I just wanna say that NYSERDA and DEC have given our sector a significant amount of time uh, over the past two years of trying to address what are complicated questions. And, and yep. we've all learned a little bit and we all, have, we all still have lots of opportunity to learn going forward. So with that, uh, I don't know, Dan, do you have anything you wanna say at the end or? There's, I don't even know if Dan's still here. Well, thank so. you, John. That's what I'll say. But yes, thank you, yeah, everyone. No, thank you all and, for, uh, for, for yeah, the thank you, John, Melanie, Dan. Thanks for the forum. Thanks, thank everybody. you, everybody. Stay tuned. So, have a thank great. You. Day. Good job. <laughs>